Hello, I have here the LEGO Star Wars The Last Jedi official set builds that have been released and reviewed on my channel up to this point. There's only one thing that's missing from this collection, and that's the small ATM6 poly bag, which I already took apart. I've not included anything here that has not been released as of the time of the recording of this video. I've not included buildable figures, obviously, the large action figures, which are a completely different thing. They don't really belong with this collection, in my opinion. And I'm going to cover minifigures in a separate video because I know that a lot of my viewers really like to focus on the minifigures and have a lot of interest in the figures so I want to provide some content for them so they don't have to go through all the build stuff that they're not as interested in. I have to give a major warning about spoilers in this video because this video will definitely include all the spoilers. I'm going to kind of do an overview of what LEGO has done for us on a, in an official capacity for The Last Jedi relative to what we actually saw in the movie. I also have to warn you that I actually liked The Last Jedi. I thought it was an imperfect movie, just like all of the Star Wars movies have been, but overall I liked it, so I'm going to be approaching this from a mostly positive perspective. So if you want to hear just lots and lots of rage and hate, this isn't the video for you. That said, though, if you know anything about me, you know that I am not afraid to criticize things that I find to be really, really bad. Really, really bad. So what are we looking at here? If I counted correctly, this is 14, one, four individual sets with retail values that total over $900. And since all of these are presently on the market, you can expect to pay something very close to that for this collection of sets. And for that kind of money, I definitely expect to see either a whole lot of different things or a whole lot of quality. Well, as it turns out, you kind of go in between there because the number of items here is not all that great, but LEGO did put a fair amount of detail into many of these things. A perfect example of that is the ski speeder in the Battle of Crate set. Now they had to make something of this this vehicle, this in-universe vehicle, since it was so heavily promoted in the trailers. You know, this was really something that was pushed a lot in the marketing for the movie. And I think LEGO did a pretty fantastic job of offering up what's practically a, a collector style model of this. It's very large. I think that it's much larger than it needed to be based upon how useful it ended up being or how useless it ended up being in the movie. But I don't think Lego could have known that it was going to be used so little. I think it made sense for them to do this. I appreciate the effort that went into it, but ultimately I just feel it would have been a more successful product if they made this maybe two thirds that size. I think it still would have had plenty of play value, still would have looked pretty cool. And uh, they even did make a $10 model of it as a micro fighter, which works out pretty well and actually scales pretty decently to the the walker, the major walker that, that was the, the main kind of enemy for this thing. I think that maybe one and a half times this size or twice this size would have been perfect. That Battle of Crate set, though, did come with some terrain, some resistance base stuff. And uh, stuff comes apart. This looks pretty good to me. Now this actually is scaled down quite a bit. It's just missing the major uh, cannon emplacements on the on the sides. But this is a nice small build that works really well with figures if you put them inside of there. This other stuff that they included in the set though, not so much. Kind of weak relatively. We also got the large BB-8 figure in the first wave of releases for this movie. And this is something that just had to happen, just had to be made. And I don't say that as someone who's proud to have uh, uh, seen this coming, you know, to have predicted the release of this large model, because I didn't. I just have it in my hands right now, and I couldn't imagine them not doing it now that I've actually had it in my hands. I mean, this thing is pretty uh, pretty lively. It looks great on display. I think for folks who just like BB-8, the character, uh, you know, as, as a character in the movie or as a build, as a design of a droid in the universe, will appreciate being able to get this, although it is expensive, but it's a lot of pieces. 
Let's talk about something from the First Order, like Kylo Ren's TIE Silencer. Lego called this Kylo Ren's TIE Fighter, but, I mean, come on, it is a fighter, and they probably just didn't have access to the final name. I think that's not a big deal, but I think that this model looks great. It plays fine. It's a solid build. It's not flimsy at all. I personally like the design of the thing in-universe, and I think that it was much more triumphant on screen than its spiritual predecessor, the advanced tie of Darth Vader. But uh, I, th I think this is just a, a really good translation of a interesting ship in-universe into Lego form with a combination of prints and real builds, you know, proper builds, and some stickers used together to create detail where necessary. And it, I think it just works, and it looks really good on display. It makes for a fine toy, and I think it makes for a fine collector's item as well. They also made this Micro Fighters version of the TIE Silencer, which is a funny little, you know, miniaturized thing. Came in act actually in a two-pack with the A-Wing uh, that was featured at the beginning of The Last Jedi. I think the A-Wing is a really nice build and a pretty pretty proper representation of the shape of the actual ship just made into this small comically small size just to have something that's either cute to put on your desk at work if you're an adult or just easy to play with if you're a younger kid and certainly easier to get i feel like the tie silencer doesn't quite live up to the sharpness and meanness of the look of the the real thing in universe whereas the full-size version does a great job of really capturing all the the important parts also from the micro fighters line we got the special forces tie fighter which is a pretty straightforward thing but it looks pretty cool and you know you easily could close that off and just have kind of a a minimally super deformed like a medium deformed version of this and we already saw this guy which i thought was a really good build for the ski speeder just looks very clean and uh, relatively new compared to the junk that was flown in the movie and just to finish off with the the micro fighters versions of things uh, we also got the slightly updated millennium falcon which is no big deal but a good looking little thing and has a nice print for the, the cockpit section and the atm6 the gorilla walker which looks more like the traditional walkers in the head doesn't quite capture the look the, the unique look of the the mega caliber six uh, walker but still is a, a fun thing to play with and looks again cute and funny on display now the full-sized atm6 set is a uh, hundred and fifty dollars us so this thing needed to really knock it out of the park with its look and its features for play and i feel like this one came up just a little bit short it's a little bit tough to pull off what they were trying to do with this it's more expensive than the previous walker which was actually roughly the same size of set unfortunately so this does not scale well to the you know the the smaller esb based walkers uh, of the past uh, it i think it makes for a fine toy but value wise it was probably a little bit lacking relative to what we've gotten before and its display value is a little bit off as well it has a little bit of gappiness uh to a degree that and and also kind of differences in in color to a degree that the previous walkers just didn't suffer as much everything just doesn't fit together quite as well and having the dark gray and the light gray together and kind of alternating back and forth between those i think just makes it even more obvious uh, how many things don't fit together and, and don't look quite as smooth as, as you might like. This thing, though, this is an interesting case. Lego calls this the First Order Heavy Scout Walker, and, well, as we all know, this did not exist in the movie. Some people try to say, yes, it did. There were two of them on crate. No, there weren't two of them on crate. There were two ATHHs on crate. These, uh, multi-legged tug things that have a lot of legs that kind of line up like this but there were 33 of them 
in three rows, so three rows of 11 each, and they were more in pairs where the fronts were connected to the back. That was all part of one single mechanism. And then there was no attack stuff on top, no turrets, no head, none of that. A very, very different vehicle than this, very different. And so where is this? Why does it even exist as, as a toy if it didn't show up in the movie? Well, I have a theory, a lot of people share this, this theory as well, based upon knowledge of how product development actually works. Lego did not get final information about exactly how the all the vehicles look in the movie uh, when it was time for them to actually start developing these things. They did not get the script. LucasArts, has, or excuse me, LucasFilm, since the very beginning, since A New Hope, has been ridiculously secretive about stuff, about everything about their, their, their films. And this, I'm certain, was no exception. Companies that do merchandising get to see concept art. They get to visit, the, in this case, Lucasfilm, while the movie is still being worked on. The movie wasn't even done. It was still being changed. And concept art has to get turned into actual products that will be sold. And that process takes a long time. It can take a year, a year and a half. So I think what happened here is that the Lego design team got to see some concept art that included some banks of legs like this in the, the Janssen uh, Strand Beast Walker style, and they didn't get full information on how it would actually be used because maybe Lucasfilm didn't even know at that time how it was actually going to be used. And so you ended up with this thing that doesn't quite match. Uh, actually, not a great toy either because the head doesn't move up and down, doesn't turn side to side, and the whole leg mechanism you know, always ends up trying to come just back down to a a flat look like that has these really obvious wheels on the sides and this is just a very forgettable set i think uh, it's definitely one that uh, collectors don't need to get because again it doesn't show up in the movie at all and yeah just kind of a pass just unfortunate speaking of unfortunate walkers should i talk about this one yet no no i'm gonna hold off just a little while longer for that I'm going to pivot instead towards some good guy stuff for a minute, starting with this Octo or Octu or however you want to pronounce it training set until we get an official canonical pronunciation released to the world officially. I really don't care how you pronounce it. You know what it is. And I think it's a good looking set. This was the one set that came with the old man Luke figure. And again, we'll look at the figures independently in a, a separate video. So a lot of people wanted that and it's cool to be able to get it in a set that's not too huge and expensive, but I just like the build personally. I think that it's shaped up pretty nicely. It's not the roundest thing, but it probably would have required a lot more pieces or more specialized pieces or more uh, stickers or something, something that would have made it not as nice. Uh, I think that Lego did a good job here of trans translating that shape of that stone hut or those stone huts over to their medium for building in a, a reasonable build that young people can put together without too much frustration and there is some play value built into this thing just just a little bit i mean of, of like action features like they like to put in you've got the little turntable here you put a figure on it and then you can have uh, Ray hitting a stone and that can be knocked over and they also have a little accidental firearm discharge damage action here but it has nice detailing on the interior as well I think more detail on the inside than it really needed and some removable stuff and usable stuff I think it just makes for a nice little setting for for display or for play it's very inviting to to bring figures into this. So it also came with a Porg and that made it you know, a, a cheap way to get an official Lego Porg and that's also a good thing. The price to part ratio for this set was pretty decent but it feels a little bit small for the price you pay and that's just a result of the seemingly never ending trend towards more detail, more detail, more detail, more detail in sets from Lego from year to year. And that results in more small pieces being used, which means more pieces for a given size of completed build. And 
what you pay for when you pay for Lego products is not based upon the weight of the the ABS plastic, just the plastic itself. It's not a mass of plastic that you're paying for. You're paying for a lot of things, which include the design, the marketing, also handling all the inventory of all the different pieces, you know, putting together the, the instructions. There's a lot of time that's involved. There's a lot of overhead that's involved, even in the just the production of the individual pieces, which heavily, heavily, heavily depends upon the number of parts, much more so than the quantity of the relatively cheap plastic pellets that they actually use. So this is just something that we can't get away from until Lego decides to stop making things more detailed. If you want more detail in a set, you're going to have to either pay more or get something that is smaller. So here's a bigger good guy thing that is very well detailed in my opinion and you pay for it. This was $110 US. Let me actually grab that and bring it in closer. I love this thing. I mean, it was not at all successful on screen, you know, what, the way they actually used it in universe in, in the film, but I still really like its in-universe design, just how it looks. It has a certain elegance and yet a certain rough and ruggedness, you know, again, just kind of ignoring how it actually performed, but Lego has captured all of that really well here, I think. And they have nice building techniques, nice parts usage, and it just ended up being a very successful thing. It's able to stand, I mean, even though it's so narrow and so tall, it's able to stand up on its own. It just has very good practical considerations. It has the turret down here that folds away automatically when you just set it on the ground. These can rotate around. This back here can rotate around. You can turn these up and down. You have things that can physically shoot with the stud shooters here that I think are integrated just fine. They don't look bad. You know, sometimes the action features look bad. I think these don't. You've got integrated spring-loaded shooters here in the front. I think those also look good. And the bombing mechanism is fantastic. Let me see if I can remember. There it is. This lower part, you push that and one of these come, come out. There's another one comes out. Another one comes out. You know, you've got a bunch of these in there. You don't have the realistic number of them, but I would never expect that. It's just nicely done. So if you want to play with it, you can. If you want to just look at it and just admire it, you can. If you want to use it as a backdrop and, and use it with figures, you can do that as well. This is the reloading mechanism. You can check out all the features of this in the review video, of course, and that's the case for each of these sets. But it has a lot of space for figures with space for two in the cockpit. It has the whole openable major section here with more figures that can be placed in there. Again, even more space than it really needs. You can fit more figures in this in this this build than they included with the set. So that's just just a really, really nice thing, a really successful thing. In my opinion, a high point of this entire line right here in my hands. I think that in the absence of a, a proper Nebulon B frigate from from Lego, I think that this makes for a nice tall display model for something from the good guy's side. Opposite that, how about the first order quote unquote Star Destroyer as Lego called it. We know in universe canonically it's a battle cruiser that's very significantly larger than the classic Imperator class Star Destroyers. I think this is like twice their size or twice their length. Really quickly, I, I do need to clarify something that just keeps coming up, misinformation that keeps coming up. Uh, a lot of folks remember this uh, most strikingly, most strongly from that one really crazy wide angle close-up shot from The Force Awakens where they show just the nose of it and it has this this cross-shaped uh, uh, just structure at the at the nose of, of one of these, a particular one of these, the finalizer, Kylo Ren's personal command ship. And a lot of folks look at that and say that's based on his lightsaber design and that's what makes the finalizer his and thus something like this cannot be the finalizer because it doesn't have this giant cross shape at the front. Well if you look up any, and I mean any, actual official reference material for the the Resurgence class battle cruisers, or you look at them in The Last Jedi, you'll see that that cross is actually a tiny little thing. It's tiny. It's just this 
little, little tip there that was made to look really huge by the very strange and very extreme camera angle uh, of that establishing shot from The Force Awakens. All of them look the same. They're all built the same. They all have that cross, and you can verify that very easily. But this can be a fi finalizer if you want it to be, or it can be just any of them. I think that as a model, as something to look at on display, this looks really good. They did preserve uh, a kind of a policy of having just studs on the outside, no anti-studs. So even these lower surfaces down here have studs coming out towards you, which I think is a really nice decision. I think this thing does not get the credit that it deserves. Ooh, looks like I can maybe get that kind of a shot here. Yeah, <laughs> so you just imagine that uh, if this had the, the little cross detail on it, it would be just a few studs, but it would look huge on camera right there. They did not include that here because it, it just realistically doesn't fit, especially with the way this thing has to fold up. And the way it folds up is really nice. I think that they have done so much better with the interior of this than they did with the previous Star Destroyers. You know, it's the same basic overall design as the previous Star Destroyers, the, the uh, original trilogy stuff, but there's so much more usable space inside of here to pose things with lots of stickers and prints both used to, I think, really good effect. Uh, you know, a lot of folks don't like stickers, and I fully understand that, and I support that, but sometimes they really add. They really, really add so much. Like all these panels up here, and what they've done with the flooring here, all this is usable space, and you can put figures in each of those. It didn't come with that many figures, but you can put them in each of those seats and still close everything up, and, you know, they'll still be able to work in there. Uh, I think that this was just the best Star Destroyer design as a as a toy that they have ever done and of course it's important to keep in mind that this is lego and it's not an elect uh, ultimate collector series set so it is a toy first and for foremost for sure uh it's you know it's it's supposed to be for kids young kids at that so it has to play well first and foremost as well but i think this one ends up looking great too i i have had this on display for a while and i love looking at it and i want to give it a more prominent place just so that i can enjoy looking at a star wars capital ship and it is a proper capital ship even though unfortunately it had to be a pretty small build because again i mean small relative to how large it would be in universe but that's again because of limitations of how many parts can be included to get the amount of detail that they mandate these days. And uh, you, know, you can't sell something that's for kids that's going to be like $800, like an Ultimate Collector Series Millennium Falcon. Really quickly, here's something small, the First Order Resistance Transport Pod. It's basically the side of the, the Force Awakens troop transport ship, uh, just made larger. Uh, I think that it's a much more successful pod at this size than it would have been had they just taken the the Force Awakens set and kind of chopped it off. It does feel, I'm sure, insulting to some fans to get just basically a piece of a set that we've gotten before, but at least it's a good piece. This has nice action there. It has great use of space. So much storage. A little bit of storage there in the front. Oops, a lot of storage in the back and on the side, so all this pulls pulls up. You can put some stuff in there. This pulls up, put a bunch of stuff in there, and it's able to very comfortably hold two figures in the cockpit section of it very comfortably, plus their accessories. Just a really nicely executed set, in my opinion. Small. Uh, it's just too bad it didn't have really much value. And it's not a very good looking thing, right? I mean, if it was iconic in the movie, if it had a lot of value to the story, then I think it would have been easier to fall in love with its ugliness. And I think that would have made it more valuable and uh, just more, I think it would have realized its potential much better as, as a, a toy here. But since it had so little value in universe and in the movie it ends up really just looking like a larger version of the side of the resistance transport ship and uh yeah it's just kind of
kind of a a win an unwinnable battle for this thing nice little set nice design nice work by the designer but not a particularly desirable thing to to actually purchase at least in terms of the build right this is just a turret that came from one of the battle packs and the battle packs are mostly about the figures so you know this is a little thing on the side no big deal this came with one of the micro fighters no big deal this came with one of the micro fighter sets no big deal all that is kind of kind of forgettable i mean it's fine but there's no point in putting a lot of time into it that thing though all right it's time let me take on that thing again the first order atst they call it now you know how earlier i was talking about how it takes a long time to develop products much longer than most people can possibly believe and how sometimes that leads to mistakes being made where products are made for things that don't actually end up in movies i mean another great example was the first order snow speeder from the force awakens that actually did appear in the movie for like a few seconds and it was supposed to be in a full-on chase scene but that chase scene was never even filmed a lot of people say it was cut from the film during editing but it was never even filmed in the first place it was it was designed it was going to happen and it didn't happen lego made a big old set for it and it, it had just a few seconds of screen time in the movie i hold on to hope that this is an example of that sort of thing having happened yet again I hold on to the hope that Lego actually believed from concept art first order ATSTs were droids and had no head and that this would be something that uh, would just go with that or that Lego was under the understanding that the scene was going to go exactly how it did but that it was going to be much much longer that you'd have a whole drawn out fight scene with a small bb-8 on not not that one small bb-8 on the top of this thing controlling it and they would take down you know the entire interior of of a major capital ship or something it was going to be this epic thing it was going to be super memorable worth creating a set like this that is my hope that is thinking very very optimistically though and uh trying hard to give them credit because as we all know because we've all seen the movie right because you're watching this video you don't want to have all these spoilers otherwise as we all know what actually happened in the scene was it started out with a whole row of first order atsts which basically look like this with a little bit of modification a little extra stuff here kind of a little bit of different eye detail very small details are different very small details are different it's still basically something like this you had a whole row of these that were in the ship let's see if I can get this to be a little bit closer in its in its pose you know basically in like a, a hangar sort of sort of scene and BB-8 unbeknownst to the viewer hops into one of them takes control of it and saves the day in this form with the thing complete because a first order ATST is an actual thing with a head and it requires drivers and such. In this case, the driver was BB-8. And then towards the end of that segment of the scene, BB-8 is like, I gotta get out of Dodge. And he goes to walk away with the thing in this form. And it's still connected to its, its little docking structure around it. And so he walks away, the legs go, the head stays behind and it kind of all just shatters, leaving us with this, with a little BB-8 exposed there. And suddenly it makes sense that, ah, BB-8 was the one who just saved the day for some of our heroes of this entire trilogy. And then for a few seconds, you get to see this in this form in the film. Seconds. And that's it. So Lego didn't make a set for that scene where you have an ATST that you could sell as a set called First Order ATST that has a removable head, maybe something that's not as nicely and strongly built as this uh, Rogue One version was, but you know, something that was a little bit more flimsy, just a little bit thinner that was designed to have the head taken off. They didn't do that so that you could actually make the scene and set. Instead, they made just what we see for a matter of seconds. The biggest problem 
that I have with this set is that this costs the same as this. This was made very recently. The price is very fair to compare and value should be as well. But this one comes with this little platform that does basically nothing. Has very little value, to be honest. I mean, it's a fine side build just to have one person go up. An elevator would have been nice to get them to go up all the way, but I mean, it's, it's just a little thing on the side. But it has no head, and it costs the same as this set, which has a full head and looks realistic for what it's supposed to be. Each set came with four exclusive minifigures. So, to me, there's absolutely no reason that this should ever have been made as, as a set as it was. Even if LEGO knew fully what the scene was going to be and they just didn't know how brief of a time it would be in this form, they should have made a set for the scene. They should have made a first order ATST set that was actually a first order ATST, which would have looked like this with just small modifications and would have had a removable head. Instead, we get this thing, which I personally think is the scene. I've, I've gone back and checked through the entire history of Lego Star Wars sets, and I, I now can say more confidently that I believe this is the single worst Lego Star Wars set ever. So that took me through a wide range of emotions, from very positive to very negative. And as a result of that, you know, I can't really give a, a score, so to speak, for this entire series as a body of work. Uh, I feel like the whole thing is kind of um, average to maybe a little bit below average, just to me, to my eyes, fully subjectively, just looking at what's here in front of me. I think that with hindsight, you know, n having seen the movie, knowing what goes on in the movie, knowing the relative importance of things, I feel like LEGO could have gone back and done a much better job with this very easily. They could have scaled things more appropriately based on importance. You know, I think they just could have done a better job for, for the entire series on the whole. I think there are some, some real high points here and some low points, one really low point. But there's no good consistency. That's, I think, something that a lot of people would, would agree with, that there isn't good consistency across this line. It doesn't feel like a strong, complete line. And that's when you look at the display value, you know, kind of the collectability, you look at the playability, the value as toys, and you look at value in general for how much you get for your money. You get some strong things here, you get some weak things. Of course, for more detailed thoughts from me and also, you know, proper looks at every feature of each of the sets, you can check out my full reviews if you haven't done that already. But at this point, I am ready to wrap up this video and get to work on the minifig specific video. And thus, I turn it over to you to share what you think about this entire series. And if you have any thoughts kind of in retrospect on any of the specific sets, what you think are the high points and the low points here, if there are any of either that kind of stand out in a good or bad way. So thank you for watching. Thank you in advance for your own feedback. And I'll talk to you again soon.